Hi, this is an introduction to philosophy where we examine some of the ultimate questions that philosophers ask. My name is Mark Thorsby and today we're going to be discussing the question, what is happiness? And in particular, today's lecture is going to be related to the idea of happiness as freedom from. So that's the title for our lecture today. So welcome back everyone. I hope you're doing well. Um, so today we're going to be talking about essentially Epicurean philosophy and Stoicism. So we're combining two different um, ethical or moral theories in our lesson today, and that is we're going to be talking about the uh, hedonist philosophy of Epicurus on the one hand, or Epicureanism, and on the other hand, we're going to be looking at um, Sto the basic tenets of Stoicism um, that come from both. Um, well, there's a number of Stoic philosophers we're reading in particular that the work of Epictetus though I'll also be talking about Marcus Aurelius. So welcome back everyone, I hope you're doing well. So here's what I want to start off with today. Um, um, ultimately in moral philosophy we talk a lot about happiness or at least in ethics and especially when we talk about ancient ethics. Up to this point in our, um, to do sort of a brief review here, up to this point in our course, our online course, we've been, we've talked about ethics in terms of relativism, We've talked about ethics in terms of utilitarianism, and with utilitarianism we saw the idea that one should pursue the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people, and there we saw happiness was de defined as pleasure. Um, we've also looked at Kant's deontological ethics that doesn't really place a lot of moral value on happiness, although I'm sure Kant would not um, disagree that happiness is a critical motivational factor for um, for why we do the certain sorts of things we do and how we make our decisions. Um, but you can see here that happiness is really quite critical. In fact, if you ask virtually anyone why they're doing what they do, right, they'll say, for instance, you can ask, for instance, why do you have the career you do? Someone will say, well, I do it so I can get money. You'll say, why do you have money? And so I can um, have the things I need in order to live. And if you keep asking long enough, eventually you're going to hit on this idea that people want happiness. And when you ask why people want happiness, for the most part they simply say, well, because I want happiness. That is, they come to an end of the explanation. Or in other words, as Aristotle will see in, a, in the next video here might say, happiness is something that we desire for its own sake. We don't desire it as an instrument or as a means to gaining something else. We desire um, happiness in its own right, such that we think that if we can achieve happiness, we'll achieve a good that's both um, self-sufficient and complete, right? So happiness is cr pretty important. Um, and over this week, as we discuss happiness, today, of course, we're going to be looking at happiness from Epicurean and Stoic, from an Epicurean and Stoic perspective. And then on our next video, we'll look at Aristotle's conception of happiness. But all three of these philosophers and philosophies ultimately agree that happiness is something to be achieved and desired for its own sake. Now, the question, though, is how do we define happiness? So you can see here, if we ask the question, what is happiness? We might say that there's fundamentally two types of definitions that are possible. On the one hand, we can talk about happiness as being a sort of freedom, or actually let me go up here. On the one hand, we can talk about happiness in a positive sense. We can say that happiness is X, or we define X as a something to be achieved, right? So there you might say, you can imagine if you ask someone, say, what's happiness? And they might say, happiness is getting all the money you need in the world, right? Becoming rich. Many people believe this, right? And that's a positive conception of happiness, where they've identified happiness as a certain sort of particular substance, process or otherwise. But we can also say that another way of defining happiness would be to define it in a negative sense. Or in other words, to say what happiness is not, or in other words, that we should avoid certain sorts of things. And we're going to see in this lecture that both Epicurus and Epictetus, or the Epicureans and the Stoics, both define happiness in this second negative sense. On the one hand, Epicurus is going to define happiness as freedom from suffering, that is freedom from pain. Um, and on the other hand, we're going to see that Epictetus defines happiness as freedom from passion, freedom from the emotional involvement we have with the objects, things in the world that we desire. Um, so we're going to see that both of these thinkers uh, understand happiness 
as a type of freedom from. Um, and so that becomes, that's why I've titled the lecture the, the way I have. And also another thing I think you'll note that as we go through the material this week, um, when we talk about Epicurus and Epictetus, is that these philosophers, unlike many moral philosophers that you may have become accustomed, especially when we looked at someone like Kant, um, these philosophers um, almost write in a very practical sense, right? Um, where it's a sort of lived existential mode of dealing with these problems. Here we don't get, though there's certainly logical argumentation that undergirds both of these philosophers, I tend to read these philosophers as really quite grounded in the nature of lived experience and the nature of um, our sort of experience in life in a sort of realistic sense. So it's not overly technical. Um, the, and so there's something attractive about that. And some people might even say that when you read Epicurus, and especially Epictetus, their, their writings read much closer to some of the wisdom literatures that we often associate with questions about life and existence. And here I'm thinking about, for instance, the Proverbs and the Bible are sort of similar. Though there are logical arguments that undergird each of the positions in these philosophies. So I don't want to um, underplay um, the philosophical and analytic rigor that each of these philosophical systems have. Now, both of these philosophies are ancient, and so as a result, um, uh, much of the original work no longer exists um, that the, the ones did regarding these philosophies. So, uh, but anyway, let's get right to it and let's start thinking about this. And today we're going to start off here with Epicurus. Um, and the first sort of thing I want to emphasize here, to say a little bit about Epicurus's life, just sort of some basic points here, is Epicurus lived from 341 to 270 BC. Now, just to give you a sense of, of when that was, that's essentially the same time frame um, as, or overlapping time frame with Aristotle. So, in fact, um, uh, Epicurus here, the founder of Epicureanism, he was actually born to Athenian parents, but he was born on the island of Samos. That's where Pythagoras was from. But when he was a boy, and when he was a boy, just as a child, Aristotle founded his, his own school, the Lyceum. Um, another thing that's important is that Epicurean moral philosophy actually was probably the most um, well-regarded or popular moral philosophy during the Hellenistic age. Um, Today in philosophy we put uh, a lot of um, today in philosophy we put a lot of emphasis on um, the philosophies of Aristotle and Plato. But in the Hellenistic age, that is the age immediately following, um, well, the age in, inaugurated by um, Aristotle the Great and going up until Ar um, up until the the Roman Empire, Epicurean moral philosophy was essentially the primary philosophy. Uh, or the most um, impactful, I suppose. So um, after that, Epi so in terms of his his life, Epicurus actually went back to Athens around the age thirty five and established his own school. His, and when I say school, it was less of a what we would consider as a school, like a university or a college or something, and more like a commune, because um, these people move there and live there. Um, and essentially, this um, notably. Epicurus also allowed both women and slaves, notable for his time, um, to actually attend his school students. So, uh, and to move in, if you will. Um, so, you can see Epicurus was, uh, he believed that this philosophy was universal and he promoted it as such. Um, he strongly emphasized, you will see, the importance of friendship and community in terms of those being central to achieving happiness. Uh, so he's going to argue that, you, that others are a necessary condition to living the good life. Um, uh, so I put here that he died of a painful bladder infection. The only reason I put that is um, it's a, sort of ironic that a philosopher who articulated hedonism as um, the central philosophical means by which we should evaluate how to live our lives should die actually a very horrible, painful death. But we're also going to see that Epicurus himself argued that Pain is either easily bearable or uh, it is limited in terms of time. So, but we're going to see here that even though the goal of 
uh, the happy life for Epicurus is freedom from suffering. He ultimately advocates pleasure as being central to the good life. He does. He doesn't think that we can ever avoid pain altogether. Pain is a necessary condition of the hu of. Uh, I'm sorry. Pain is a necessary element within the human condition. Now, what I'm going to talk about now as we go through this, there's a lot to talk about, but unfortunately, there's only three surviving works of Epicurus's philosophy. At least, in, and there's some fragments, but. Uh, the three principal works that from which we derive Epicurean philosophy comes from first the letter to Herodotus, famous historian. You probably should have heard of him. Uh, and this concerns his discussion of physics. And we'll mention that here in just a moment. There's the letter to Menosius, and that concerns his ethics. That's where pretty much, in fact, I think I've given you the entire letter of, to Menosius to read as um, um, your reading assignment. And then finally, there's the letter to Pythocles, in which Epicurus establishes and discusses his cosmology. Now, scholars do believe that Epicurus wrote more than this, um, but unfortunately it is no longer existent within our literature. So, this is where we principally get all of our work on our discussion of Epicurus from, as well as um, early classic commentators, including uh, early classic, especially Roman commentators on Epicurean philosophy. Now, I want to mention something here about the physics, and this concerns what I'm calling the influence of Democritus. Uh, just to remind you, Democritus was a pre-Socratic philosopher. Uh, uh, Democritus is not a pre-Socratic philosophy, but he's a pre-Socratic philosopher. And he was a philosopher who was a materialist. He argued that the world was essentially made up of matter. But what was it made of? It was made up of atoms, and so he's the he's a principal. No, he's not the first, but he's the principal philosopher who pre-Socratic philosopher who advocated atomism. And remember, atom meant no cut. So literally, his view is that the world is made up of tiny little, uh, and they have ver the various sizes, but tiny little things called atoms that could not be cut or broken apart. That is, they were irreducible. And that these irreducible elements are constantly in motion, moving around in a, in a vortex. And so there's this universe as a vortex. And you'll recall, we talked about a number of pre-Socratic philosophers, other pre-Socratic philosophers, who talked about the vortex. So we have all these atoms in this sort of vortex that are moving, which means that all that means which means that everything that is changing can be understood as changing precisely because or precisely in terms of a rearrangement of the atomic composition of those things. So things don't really go in and out of existence as much as they're just changing their shapes. Um, and of course this accords very closely to our modern uh, atomic physics. Of course modern atomic physics does not hold that atoms are irreducible or that is that they cannot be broken apart. Um, now, but here's the thing that's important about Democritus is Democritus argued um, for a deterministic view of the world or determinism. And determinism is important because determinism argues that all, at least the sort of universal determinism of Democritus, argued that all things are determined according to certain natural laws of motion. Um, and, and, right, so it's the laws of motion in the vortex which determine the composition of the atoms. And ultimately, if determinism is true, then that means that freedom was an illusion. That is, when I think that I can freely choose to do one thing versus another, and by freedom, I mean the idea that I have the agency or the capacity to act in a way that's unpredictable, this is an illusion for Democritus. Uh, but here's the thing. If the universe is determined, then that means that ethics ultimately has no um, normative ethics is an impossible sort of thing right because without the possibility of freedom normative ethics is impossible or in other words if i can't freely choose to act in such and such a way then it doesn't make sense to say i should act in such and such a way right uh, the whole idea of ethics is to say we ought to do this or we ought not do this but if i don't have a choice then what does it matter it doesn't right so epicurus recognized this and he argued for what's known as the swerve and the swerve was the idea that the atoms swerve in an uncaused fashion. Um, that is, there was sort of a randomness in the, in the material world, which enabled something like the possibility of freedom. Now, Epicurus, especially in the letter, it's too briefly discussed to give us a thorough and sufficient understanding. Though we might say that, for instance, modern phys uh, materialist theories of ethics, for instance, process thought or um, the process philosophy, you can look at Whitehead who talks about this, 
there and modern theories do try to introduce something like the Epicurean swerve. But what's notable here is that Epicurus L number one is a materialist, so he thinks that everything is made up of matter. But unlike Democritus, he thinks that there is a principle whereby agency is possible. So he wants to argue that there's a physical material world, but that that's not the only story, right? Now, what are some of the other key ideas I want to mention here? Is Epicurean philosophy is a type of hedonism. Hedonism. And hedonism is any philosophy that has pleasure as a central element. So hedonism is a pleasure-centered ethic where the idea there is that the happiest life is the most pleasurable life, right? <clears throat> And we're going to, um, happy, the happiest life is the most pleasurable life. Now, the question, though, is determining which pleasures will get you, or, or that is, which sorts of things you ought to pursue to get you the most pleasurable life. And we're going to see that Epicurus gives a more sophisticated answer than just, if it feels good, do it, um, right? In fact, he's going to say there's two principal types of pleasures. There's pleasures of motion. These are called kinematic pleasures. Um, that is, pleasures when I'm moving around and doing things. Uh, think about exercise as an example, right? Um, or another one would be, um, for instance, erotic love, or um, what would be another? Or think about a, a great a, a walk through the forest or a hike or something. These are all pleasures of motion. Pleasures of rest, by contrast, or what the Greek here is catastomatic pleasure. Um, these are pleasures of rest. And in fact, I put a star here because according to Epicurus, the pleasures of rest should be desired before pleasures of motion. Or in other words, the pleasures of rest are better to have. Why? Uh, well, one reason is because um, all of us as human beings have bodies that are in a state of decay over time. Slowly, we're slowly losing the functionability of our body. Or in other words, over time, especially as we become elderly, we will lose the capacity to move. Um, and so pleasures of motion are lost when we lose the ability to move. But pleasures of rest are not lost because we don't lose the ability to rest, or at least um, unless we, gain, unless we um, have some sort of intellectual disease, for instance, Alzheimer's. Um, but, catas but for instance, the pleasure of reading philosophy or reading a good book, these pleasures can be had one's entire life. So pleasures of rest should be desired first, and pleasures, they're, they're more fundamental, whereas pleasures of motion, we should also desire these, but they are secondary, we might say. Now, when we talk about pleasure, we should see here that um, pain is either short-lived or easily bearable. And I mentioned this with regard to Epicurus's um, death, right? So he thinks that pain is normal. We all experience pain, but that when we do experience pain, it's either briefly or it's enough that we can control, we can bear it. Um, so... Even So even if we have pain in our lives, it doesn't mean that we can't have a good life. So wait a second. What is happiness then? Well, the word that Aristotle uses to define happiness is ataraxia. Ataraxia. And as I already mentioned, ataraxia here can be defined as freedom from suffering or um, freedom from turmoil is another uh, translation of it. But notice here that freedom from suffering makes suffering the default position, right? The idea here is that all of us have, that life always includes a state of suffering, right? Um, so if that's the case, we can define pleasure as the absence of pain. Now, so far, we're not in roughly different territory than utilitarianism. Because remember, utilitarians also define pleasure as the absence of pain. Uh, but here's the thing to remember, is the utilitarians are deriving their concept from Epicurus here. Right, but they don't take everything Epicurus has to say into account. Right, they, they, the utilitarians see pleasure as something that should be maximized to the greatest amount of, to the greatest extent and over the greatest amount of people. Uh, right, but we're going to see that Epicurus's philosophy here is fundamentally individualistic. So he's not concerned with the idea of what what's in everyone's interest. He's concerned you, or he's advocating that we should be concerned with what's in our interest. Uh, and that is we want to avoid pain. Now, there's different types of pain, obviously, because there are different types of pleasures, right? Um, now, uh, we can talk about there being, obviously, uh, pains of rest and pains of motion, potentially, right? Think of depression uh, or think about bleeding, right? Becoming cut or something like this.
that would be a pain of motion. So there's different types of pain, different types of pleasures. We want to avoid the pain and thereby gain happiness, right? So happiness is defined again in this negative sense. So what does this mean? It raises the question, well, wait a second, but is every pleasure equal? Should we pursue all of these different pleasures? Uh, and we're going to see that Epicurus says, no, they're not, right? And here are the, what are known as the basic doctrines. And Epicurus's uh, uh, letter here, he describes some of the basic doctrines. And, um, and we're going to, well, I'm sorry, going roundabout. I want to give you the basic doctrines first, and then I want to give you the precise answer to which sorts of pleasures we should or should not pursue. Okay, so here's the basic doctrines. Number one, he says that we should reject the beliefs of the masses, especially the beliefs that the most people have about the gods and the divine. Now, Epicurus believes that the gods exist. So he He's a polytheist, but he believes that there are gods, but he doesn't agree with Greek religion or Hellenistic religion. He thinks that what most people believe is false. Now, one, one element of that is that there is no immortality. In fact, um, right, and, and he wants to say that, that that's an unnecessary and an unnatural desire, and it causes pain. In fact, he's going to argue that, in, that the desire for immortality actually causes suffering. Um, and so if we want to be free from suffering, we have to free ourselves from wanting to live forever, especially after we die. Um, so there is and so there is no immortality. Now, he says death is nothing to us, though. Why would he say that? Because he wants to say that, number one, all things that we consider as good or evil come from sensation. Right. So remember, he's a materialist. So we have physical bodies. And the only way we know that something's good or bad is through the sensation we derive from things. So. If someone slaps me in the face, right, then that causes pain and I recognize that as evil, right? Um, if I sense something good, I read a book and I, I gain this pleasure of rest, then that's also a sensation and I recognize good to it. But death is something very different. Death is quite literally the annihilation of, of sensation in total, right? When I die, I will lose the capacity to feel anything. But when I, by losing the capacity to feel anything, the possibility for sensation is gone. Thereby, the possibility of knowing things as good or as evil is also lost. So, but that means in, protect, in particular that death, um, because it turns me into nothing, right? It takes away my sensation and thereby takes away any possibility of sensing things that are bad. So, death actually frees us from pain. Um, so death is not something to be feared, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a little bit further on as I keep going, but um, Aristotle, um, Epicurus' argument against death is well known here. Um, so he also concludes that living well and dying well ultimately need to be understood as the same thing, the same task, okay? So these are some of the basic doctrines, but let's get into some of the more particular elements here. What pleasures should we desire? Now, he categorized desire into two types. We have natural desires and we have unnatural or vain desires, right? So the natural and vain. So for instance, a natural desire is the desire um, uh, for, um, um, for to have friends, right? It's not to be lonely, right? For instance, that's a natural desire. An unnatural desire would be, for instance, to be friends with everyone, right? <laughs> Um, well, I don't know if that's unnatural, uh, but it's not necessary. We might say that uh, an unnatural desire, for instance, would be the desire to have a Maserati, right? Um, that sounds pretty cool to have a Maserati or a Porsche or something like that instead of the ugly car I do have. And so, but that's an unnatural desire. It's unnecessary. In fact, ha the desire to have an automobile at all is actually unnatural. No one is born wanting to have a car, right? But people are born wanting to have friends, right? And so out of the natural desires, there's necessary and there's merely natural desire, or there's merely natural but unnecessary desires. So we have necessary and unnecessary desires. Um, unnecessary desires are maybe natural, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should pursue them, right? Ultimately, what he's going to argue is that we should pursue those desires which are both natural and necessary. Now, of the necessary natural desires, he says there's three types those that are we desire for life, those we desire for ease or comfort, and those we desire for happiness. So, let, or let me go back here. Let me go back here. Whoops. 
But let's before I sort of give you the list of these, let's talk about these unnatural desires. Um, an example of this is sex or erotic love. Um, Epicurus is famous for arguing that even though he's a hedonist, he does, argues that we should pursue the greatest amount of uh, not, I'm sorry, that we, we should pursue pleasure or the absence of pain. He's going to argue that not all pleasure should be pursued. And for, for instance, one such pleasure is sex or the pleasure derived from erotic love. He doesn't deny that that, that is pleasurable, but he thinks that it's unnecessary. That is, it's unnecessary for life. So the question becomes, well, wait a second. Why should I not pursue these natural, though, for instance, unnecessary desires? Here's the answer, is because some pleasures actually cause pain, right? So, for instance, a good example of this is to think about um, debauchery. So, think about people who get drunk. When someone gets drunk, they're in a state of pleasure while they're drunk. At least, typically speaking, we we usually understand that's why people want to get drunk is because they enjoy it in some sense. There's some sort of pleasure they derive from it. But here's the problem. Um, Drunkenness also causes a hangover. It causes illness after, after the uh, after you're done being drunk. Then you feel sick, right? And so that means that some pleasures cause pain. And so the idea here is that if we want the most pleasurable life, we want it by avoiding pain. So that means there's certain pleasures we should avoid because they cause pain. And he thinks that erotic love is one of these. Um, in fact, he wants to say that anything that's unnecessary, right? That, and so unnatural desires are automatically unnecessary. And some natural desires, they're merely natural, but they're unnecessary. They can cause pain, right? And he's going to contrast, for instance, the, le the, the sort of pleasure I gain from erotic love causes more pain than the type of love I gain from, instance, um, not from food and drink, but uh, think about, for instance, friendship, right? Friendship. Um, natural sort of platonic friendship. So just be, be having being friends with someone that gives me a certain type of pleasure. Um, but then if I compare the sorts of ple if I compare two different pleasures, erotic pleasure with platonic pleasure, platonic friendship versus erotic friendship, both of these give me pleasure, but the but the one the erotic one, right? ultimately will cause more pain, right? And I don't just mean in terms of your boyfriend, you know, or your girlfriend dumping you, but also in terms of the idea that if you fall in love with someone erotically and you, you know, let's say you marry that person and you live with them the rest of your life, when they die, that's going to cause more pain for you emotionally than, for instance, if one of your other friends dies. Now, uh, a sort of platonic friend. Now, it's true that if your platonic friend dies, you will have pain, but you will have less intense pain. So, ultimately, um, erotic relations cause more pain, and so he says you don't need them, right? You can live without them, so you shouldn't pursue them, right? Um, and again, it's individualistic, so he's not arguing, because obviously erotic relations are necessary for a species to exist, um, but as an individual, one doesn't need to enter into erotic relationships. And in fact, he's going to argue that the more erotic relationships one enters into, the more painful life one's going to live, right? Now, let's go back here. When when Epicurus says there's three types of pleasures we should pursue, the first are the pleasures for life. And I'm just giving you examples. There's more that are possible here, but example here is food and drink, right? I need to be able to drink water in order to live, and I need to eat food in order to exist. So these are natural and they're necessary. I have to have these things, and so we should desire them. Now, um, but we shouldn't desire vain or unnatural desires. Now, here's another example. I have a natural desire um, to eat food, but an unnecessary or merely natural desire, example here would be gourmet food. Do I have to eat gourmet meals all the time? Well, no. It may be natural that I want to eat good food, that I want to eat food, but it's unnecessary um, to eat um, gourmet food all the time, right? So he thinks that you should avoid the desire for these unnecessary things like gourmet foods, right? Because it will cause more pain. Another example is think about this. When, um, when you desire something, if you don't get, attain the thing you desire, then that causes pain as well, right? Think about if you've ever wanted a gift for Christmas when you were a kid and then you didn't get it, right? Your expectation and your sort of longing for that gift caused a lot of pain when you didn't receive the gift, right? 
But think, if you had never desired um, that thing to begin with, then you would have never felt all the discomfort and sadness by not receiving it, right? So what does that mean? It means that if we can control which desires we have, we can control what sorts of pains we're going to have to endure. Uh, and so, if we, the, so we should always desire moderately because otherwise we open ourselves up. So think about, for instance, a rich person versus a poor person. A person who's rich becomes accustomed um, to certain sorts of wealthy um, commodities, right? Lug certain sorts of luxuries, right? But that also means that they open themselves up to more pain, right? So the person who's always lived a luxurious life and then suddenly loses those luxuries is in a lot more pain than the person who's never become accustomed to those luxuries and thereby has never had pain by losing those. So that means that we should avoid desiring certain things that are unnecessary because we'll lose them eventually anyway, right? Especially with death. So we should, though, we should, it's fine to desire um, those necessary desires for life, but we should avoid the ones which are unnecessary. The same thing is we also desire certain pleasures for ease or comfort. For instance, clothing, shelter, sleep. These are all, and you might even say sleep borders on being for comfort as well as um, for life. Because, um, of course, Epicurus didn't have this knowledge, but today we know that people can't live very well and for very long without any sleep. So people need sleep. Uh, but you might say there's a certain a certain sort of in between between comfort and and life that sleep maybe falls between. And finally, there's those desires that are necessary and natural for happiness. And friendship is a good one, but reason is also quite central here. And so he's going to say, for instance, that education would be another one. This is education can be a natural, necessary desire for happiness. Um, but you can also imagine that it's possible to argue that. There is unnatural or rather unnecessary, um, there can be an unnecessary desire for too much education, I guess, potentially. Um, so these are the, let me move through these again. So these are the different pleasures we should pursue, okay, the basic category. But the basic idea again here is you want to pursue those which are, are those desires. It's You want to have those desires which are natural and necessary desires for these things. Right, and the principle, the modus operandi here, is that you should avoid, right, wanting to have, um, you should avoid those pleasures, um, which are unnecessary because you may lose those and thereby cause more pain for you in your life. Right, in fact, not only may you, you will lose them, right, as you get older or when you die, at some point you're going to lose the capacity to have those pleasures. So. Um, maybe you should desire them to begin with, right? So how should we live our life? Well, a couple sort of things. Number one, we ought to avoid pain and fear, right? And pleasure is needed, in, and pleasure is central element here. Pleasure is needed in pain, but without pain, there is no need for pleasure. So here the idea here is that pain is that default position again. It's a necessary element for our lives. So we shouldn't feel bad that there is pain. So just because that we do experience pain doesn't mean that happiness is impossible. The question is, um, to what extent um, can we uh, be free from those pains? And he's giving us a cue with his analysis of desire that we just spoke on. The other thing here is he thinks that pleasure is the beginning and end of the blessed life. So he thinks that pleasure is where it's at, right? Uh, but we should pursue these moderate pleasures because over the long run, we can have more pleasure that way. It's true that if we go back to friendship versus sex, for instance, it's true that sex gives me a much more intense um, form of pleasure than just having some, a platonic friendship, right? But the thing is, in the long run, the intensity of the one actually causes a greater intensity of pain, too. So... He thinks I should have, I should pursue friendship over that. So that's sort of a good thing to think about there, right? So you want to pursue only those natural, necessary desires, and a right understanding brings both health and freedom from suffering. So here, when you say right understanding, you can see here that he's going to argue that education is quite important, obviously as an element, because one can't have right understanding unless one has knowledge, right? So the pursuit. So you might even say that knowledge is one of these natural necessary desires as well. And all of the virtues that we can ever talk about are always linked to prudence, right? That is, 
uh, prudentially determining what we, uh, that is being prudent or determining what one should or should not desire, right? And, and all of the virtues are ultimately about learning how to choose that, right? Um, and, and ultimately his sort of model of desire and his hedonism here helps explain how we can live our life. Now, but here's the thing, right? Um, so we might say, just as a sort of summary here, that Epicurean hedonism always was going to advocate a moderation of desire, okay? And that's just a central element within the whole, the whole, the whole philosophy here. So let's move here now to Stoicism. And Stoicism is another one of these freedom from philosophies. So like at, for Epicurus, there's freedom from pain or freedom from suffering and turmoil. We're going to see with the Stoics, the idea is freedom from passion pathos, right? Uh, that is our sort of emotional involvement and attachment that we attach to things. We need to be free of that sort of emotional attachment. And that's what happiness is. Now, one of the things I love about Stoicism is that Stoicism really, um, it's a wide philosophy in the sense that um, the, some of the, the two major proponents of it, Roman proponents, are Marcus Aurelius on the one hand, who is the Roman, who is the emperor of the Roman Empire at the height of the Roman Empire, which means that he was, uh, you might classify him as the most successful and the most powerful Roman Emperor of all time. And he was actually a Stoic philosopher. Um, and on the other hand, another person, the person we're actually reading is Epictetus. And Epictetus was a former Roman slave. So, it, so you can see here the, the breadth uh, with which Stoic philosophy impacted the Roman world, for instance. On the one hand, we have the most powerful people, uh, Marcus Aurelius, and on the other hand, we have someone who is probably the weakest of individuals within Roman class society, that is a slave, advocating the same principles that one ought to live by. So this is sort of interesting. This is, if you will, a philosophy that extends to all, or um, and it had appeal to all people within um, within Roman life. So. Um, so let's sort of go through it here. So what are the what's the basics of Stoicism? Well, first off, Stoicism was founded by Zeno of Citium, and originally in Athens, right? Um, and in Athens, uh, Zeno would give talks on his own porch, right, or his stoa, which is the Greek term for porch, like portico. Um, and that porch is is where the name Stoicism comes from. Right. But the philosophy of Zeno is fundamentally the same, though mo most people today, when they talk about Stoicism, are going to refer to Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, probably Epictetus more so. Right. But for both of these philosophers, happiness is defined by the term apatheia, which in Greek, apa, just like in the other, other term, ataraxia, um, the a is a negative, negative, and pathia refers to pathos. So this means something like freedom from pathos. And pathos here refers to the passion we have for things. And passion, I think in a sort of psycho modern psychological sense, we might call our emotional involvement or emotional entanglement in certain objects and things in the world. Now, before we sort of get into the sort of kind of the analysis and the nuts and bolts of Stoicism, it's important to talk a little bit about the Stoic belief in divine providence, because we're going to see that that is a really a central element to the whole thing. And so here's the basic argument regarding divine providence. The Stoics believed they were polytheist as well, so they believed that there was a multitude of gods, but they, but they believed that all things that had happened in the world happen according to divine will. And so, and divine will is always good. So the Stoics do not, um, they do not agree with Greek religion. So they don't agree with the sort of kind of, uh, you know, we think of Zeus and, or if you're going with the Romans, we think of um, Jupiter and you can imagine these different, um, different gods fighting it out and this sort of thing. Right, uh, the Stoics don't agree with that. They and though, though they may agree with the names of the gods, but they don't agree to the idea that the gods can be good and bad. Right, the idea is that there's a divine will that permeates the universe, and the Stoics believe that it was ultimately reasonable or rational. Right, in fact, Marcus Aurelius calls the our ability to reason that part of us that which is a spark of the divine. Right, so the idea here is that all things happen according to divine will. Divine will is always good, 
right? And so that means that all things that happen in the world happen by divine will and they are good things. So if all things that exist are good, then evil must be an illusion. And what is conceived of as evil is based on a limited understanding and ignorance of divine will. So the basic idea here is that divine providence is that all things that happen in the world, right, um, all things are good um, because they happen because the gods want them to happen, right? So um, as a result, when we see things as evil, when we think something is bad or bad, it's because we don't understand the divine plan, right? So conceivably what you could say is that the idea here would be that, for instance, even when something bad happens to me, like for instance, someone hits my car, right? Here's sort of an example, right? Imagine someone hits my car and I see that as a bad thing, right? Obviously. Um, but imagine I go to the, I call my insurance company and then the, I talk to a woman on the phone and then imagine, this isn't true, but imagine that I fall in love with the person on the phone and then I marry that person and it changes my life for the good, right? So you can imagine in that sort of scenario that what I thought was bad in terms of the car accident was actually good in terms of me finding a life mate or something like that. Now, that's a purely hypothetical because I'm already married and whatnot. But you can imagine this is the sense that the Stoics have when they talk about divine providence. So the idea is things happen. They may appear to be evil. But actually, they're happening according to the God's plan, and as such, they're actually good. So when I think that things are bad, it's because I actually am ignorant to what, what the divine will wants. I'm ignorant to divine providence. So in order to understand this, then, we have to make a key distinction, right? And so if all things are good by divine will, and yet we perceive things as evil or bad, then we have to distinguish between two things. On the one hand, we have to distinguish our judgments from the things themselves, right? So, for instance, um, when that person hits my car, I make a judgment, right? The, the actual action that happened, the thing itself, right, was neither, was, was good, according to divine providence, but it's my judgment that makes the event turn into this dark color, right? It's my, or it's my judgments about things that color my judgment to the things, right? So suffering doesn't, so suffering comes from our judgments about things. It doesn't come from the things themselves. But all of this I want you to see is, is hinged or dependent upon the stoic insistence of divine providence. So that means that for instance, so, the same thing can be seen as both good and bad. Think about this for instance, or think about the example I just gave, right? My gate, when I first, when the person first hit my car, I saw that thing as a bad thing. But maybe now, 20 years later, because that was what caused me to meet my wife, I see the car accident as a good thing. So you can see that the same action can be classified as good in one way and bad in another way. Well, how can something be both good and bad at the same time? It doesn't make sense. The argument, because that would be a contradiction. So the argument is that the things that in themselves are always good. So these things are always good. Where bad comes from is it comes from our judgments, right? And our judgments, most importantly, are something we can actually control. And because of we can control our judgments, that means that we can control um, to we can control the evil that we perceive in the world. How do we do so? By modifying our judgments. And so how are we going to modify our judgments? Well, we're going to modify our judgments, similar to Epicurus, by analyzing our desires and learning to judge only those things that are within our control and judging our desires. So, um, so this is going to be sort of about desire. Now, unlike Ep like Epicurus, there are two types of desire, but unlike Epicurus, they're different. He says, on the one hand, we can desire things that are within our control, things that we can control. And on the other hand, we can desire things that are beyond our control, things outside of our control. And in all cases, we either try to attain or avoid these various things we desire. So, for instance, I can desire um, not to become upset when uh, my daughter talks back at me or something like this. Um, that would be an example of trying to avoid, for instance, getting angry or something like this. So, But that's something within my control. I can also desire... For instance, to become, uh, to, to take a little bit more, to be more self-controlled, for instance, 
let's say when it comes to um, to not buying desserts when I go out to eat or something. I don't usually buy desserts, but that's an interesting example, right? I can control my desire for those desserts. So it's either, well, I guess that's to avoid a dessert, but, or let me think for instance, what if I desire um, to be a little bit more, to be more forgiving towards others, right? That's something that's within my control. And that's something I want to attain. That is, I want to attain forgiveness. By contrast, I can also desire things that I can't control, right? For instance, something that um, reputation is an example. I can my reputation obviously is some is determined to some extent by how I live my life, but but it's ultimately dependent upon what others think of me, which means other people control my reputation, right? Even if I'm a good person, if others want to destroy my reputation, they can, right? They can. So that means that should I should I place my desire um, on these things that are outside of my control? And the answer is no. So what is within your control? Um, the truth is, is that the majority of desires that we have are things outside of our control, right? We want to be happy. We want to, I'm sorry, we want to be famous. We want to be rich. We want to get this job. We want that car. We want this girlfriend. We want this boyfriend, et cetera, et cetera. But all of those things are determined outside of us, which means that if we don't attain or avoid those things, then we're not going to be happy, right? So he thinks that we should not desire these, but ironically, this is where most of us find the thing we want. The things we should desire are those things that are within our control. And what is in my control is my judgments first and foremost. What, what, what is in my control are my passions. How I, uh, or my passions. And my, pa oh, I, let me step back, actually. Step back, actually. What is in control, most importantly, are my passions. And my passions are determined by my judgments, right? So my emotional involvement depends upon the judgments I make. So for instance, imagine for instance, if, if I go home and I suddenly discover that my wife is sleeping with someone else, right? Let's say I walk in on a sort of moment of adultery, right? Obviously, I, well, the question is, should I become upset by this? Well, here's the thing is my desire for my wife um, to remain, um, um, chased outside of my her relationship with me for instance that's something outside of my control I can't control what she does right what I can control is my judgment about it and what the Stoics want to say is that I know that all things happen according to divine providence and so even though I may have just walked in on my wife sleeping with someone else right that my judgment should actually be that that she is acting actually in accordance with divine providence, even though I can't recognize that uh, I, I can't, for instance, in that moment, see how is this in the God's will or in God's will, because um, most people are monotheists today, um, right? The answer is, I should, because I can because of divine providence, I should modify my judgment and recognize that just because she's she's doing that doesn't actually mean. Um, that she's doing what's wrong because all things that happen are good. So what that means is that I should I should control my passions um, based and modify my passions based upon my judgments. And so the idea here is that I should be free of that passion. You can imagine the passion I would most likely feel is anger, right? Um, but I should have, but my anger is based upon my judgment that it's a bad thing. But it's not a bad thing because it actually is in accordance with divine will, right? So. The Stoics want to say that, listen, when you recognize this, you should become sort of detached, if you will, from all of the things that are happening outside of you, right? Um, now, the central thesis here means that we cannot control that which is beyond our control, and so we should align our desires only with those things in our capacity to control. This amounts to controlling our passions about the world around us rather than letting our passions control us. And we can control our passions by recognizing which judgments we should and should not have. Now, famously, this sounds this this philosophy is very uh, powerful. But a sort of thing to recognize here is I, it's probably easy for I'm sure many people even watching this video are thinking. But wait a second, can you really control your passions when you see your wife cheating on on you or or something like that? Um, aren't you? Isn't it just natural to control to go crazy? Well, the Stoics are not fools. They know that it's very, very difficult 
to maintain the control of oneself, to control your judgments, and to control these passions. And so um, they actually advocated what a later philosopher, Michel Foucault, called various techniques of the self. That is, the Stoics developed a series of techniques to help you learn to control your judgments and practice controlling your desires so you could live the happiest life, the happiest life possible. You might even say that the Stoics are the earliest um, self or the earliest self-help philosophers, right? They believe, though, that you should have to focus on certain sorts of te techniques. And he actually discussed three of these main techniques, but I've listed a couple of them more than the main three, right? Um, Stoicism requires a training of the self. And one of the ways they did that is through self-writing. And the idea was that the Stoics believed that every day you should be at the end of each day, you, could, you should have a journal, and you should write down a list of everything that happened and note where you sort of lost control of your passions and where you made judgment, miss, you made bad judgments. You made judgments about things themselves rather than about um, your, your perception of things, right? Um, but you should list that, right, and sort of keep a catalog of that so that when it happened again, you could have, begin to habituate um, apathia. <laughs> they also advocated community support, uh, and many times there's discussion about um, you should write letters to other Stoics and continue to sort of discuss how where you've done and where you uh, where you succeeded and where you failed. Right. So there's this notion that the Stoics should depend upon each other and help each other out through sort of community support. Uh, but there's also the notion of meditation, various types of meditation to help you think and learn about. Um, about what should be desired. And as an example here, let me read just a quick excerpt from Marcus Aurelius's meditations. Now remember, Marcus Aurelius, when he wrote this, <coughs> pardon me, was the most powerful Roman emperor in the whole world. And, um, or he was the most powerful Roman emperor in the enti entire Roman history. Um, and when he was alive, he was the most powerful person in the whole world. So sorry, sort of mix that up. And he sort of gives an example of what sort of the type of meditation you could pursue to help you learn to control yourself and your passions. And so he writes, this is from the beginning of book two. He says, begin the morning by saying to yourself, I shall meet with the busybody, the ungrateful, the arrogant, the deceitful, the envious, the unsocial. All right, I'm going to meet with a whole bunch of people I can't control. And all of these things happen to them by reason of their ignorance of what is good and evil. But I, who have seen the nature of good that is beautiful, and of the bad that is ugly, and the nature of him who does wrong, that it is akin to me, not only of the same blood or seed, but that it participates in the same intelligence and in the same portion of divinity, right? The idea there is that all of us have that divinity, that, that unique um, divine spark, right? Reason, right? And that even these people who are angry and hateful, they're like me, actually, right? And then he goes on here, he says, I can neither be injured by any of them, nor can one fix on me what is ugly, nor can I be angry with my kinsmen, nor hate them, for we are made for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the upper rows of the lower teeth. To act against one another is contrary to nature, and it is acting um, against one another by to be vexed and to turn away. And he goes on, whatever this is that I am, it is a little flesh and breath. And the ruling part, throw away your book, he writes, no longer dist distract yourself, it is not allowed. But as if you were now dying, despise the flesh. It is blood, bones, and a network, a contexture of nerves, veins, and arteries. See the breath also, what kind of thing it is, air, not always the same, but every moment sucked in and out again. The third, then, is the ruling part. Consider, you are an old man. No longer let this be a slave. No longer be pulled by the strings like a puppet to unsocial movements. No longer be either dissatisfied with your present lot or shrink from the future. All, all that is from the gods is full of providence. And he goes on. But, for instance, one of these meditations, to put it sort of in normal language here, is Think about it. Begin every mo morning when you're brushing your teeth, and do this after tomorrow. Now that you've watched this video, uh, when you're brushing your teeth tomorrow, as you're brushing your teeth, say, "What am I? I'm looking at a future corpse, right? Someday this body, this flesh that I have wrapped around my skeleton, will fall, 
will 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 fall as I get older. I'll get wrinkles. I'll become ugly. My teeth will fall out. They will rot. My body will lose its its coherence, and I will literally become a corpse at some point. Right? My flesh comes in. My I'm sorry. My breath is sucked in and out again. We are animals, right? They're they're, they're going to die, right? And do that every morning to remind yourself of the fact that should I make it, should I feel bad about that? No, right? It is natural, right? And it happens according to to sort of nature that I should become older with time and that my body should decay. The where I get bothered by that is because I make a judgment that it's a bad thing for that to happen. Think about all of these people. You see all these um on television, you see all these commercials to get you know these creams and this this um, uh, makeup to make you look young they call it rejuvenating cream but think about it no matter who, no matter how many creams you use you're still going to get old and die right um, so the question is why are you trying to hold on to something that you can by nature not hold on to forever and the answer is that it's a confusion of judgment you've We've judged that it's bad to become old, but it's natural. And in their view, it's also divine providence. It's God's will, right, um, that we become old. And the, and the, the pain, right, the suffering we, we feel comes from our judgment that it's a bad thing. And when we recognize that our judgment is the problem, not the thing itself, we learn to recognize that we're desiring something outside of our control, right, by desiring to look young, all the way into my 80s or something, right? Think of all of these um, actresses and actors who go get all this plastic surgery so they look young forever, right? Well, what are they doing? They're trying to control something they can't control. And of course, they're going to fail ultimately, which means what? It means they will be unhappy ultimately. So this is an example of how we can use meditation, right? The Stoics argue, to help us recognize um, are what we should and shouldn't desire. And if we do this consistently, he thinks we'll slowly become free of all these passions we have for things that are completely outside of our control, right? Also, silence and abs abstentions, the idea we should abstain from things that teaches us self-control, and also silence. We have this desire to talk all the time. Sometimes we learn greater by listening, for instance. Um, try it. One of these days, do a day of silence or something and say, I'm trying to try not to talk and I'm just going to listen to those who are around me. And one of the things you'll start to recognize, the Stoics would advocate, and I think there's some truth to this, is that you'll begin to recognize that other people have their judgments, uh, are placing their judgments on things outside of them. And when you're silent, you also silence um, those passions you have. So. One of these days, try a day of silence, and I think you're going to find that you're going to learn a lot about who you are, and you're going to learn a lot about what you desire, um, and the sorts of judgments in the, that you make about things, right? And finally, is to memorize um, memorizations. And so the Stoics advocated the idea that one should practice memorizing, for instance, the various Stoic teachings, uh, the principal doctrines of Stoicism, for instance. I encourage you to take a look at this book. It's a great book, Marcus Aurelius, or the Encridian, uh, which is Epictetus' key work. That's the one we're looking at here. But the analysis that we're talking about here is equally displayed in both of them. Now, here's a final sort of quote. I hope you can read it. This comes from Epicurus. I guess I'll zoom in here. And I think this sort of sums up the real gist of it. He says, Seek not that which, uh, uh, seek not that the things which happen should happen as you wish, right? But wish the things which happen to be as they are, and you will have a tranquil flow of life. There's a deep insight there, right? When we desire, right, the idea here is don't desire that the world is the way you wish it was. Rather, desire that the world be as it is, and you will be happy. And I think there's a deep truth to that, right? I'm happy when I want to change the world and make it the way I want it to be. Because ultimately, I don't have the power to do that, right? Imagine, I want to be a well-known philosopher. I want to make a lot of money. I want to get a Maserati. I want all these things that are outside of my control. Instead of desiring thing, 
desiring that the world was different so that it, it, it met the desires I want, what if I desire that the world is the way it is already? If that's the case, then I'll recognize that my desires have already been attained. And if they've already been attained, then I can quiet my passions of discomfort in, in further desires because I've already achieved happiness, right? And there's a very Buddhist sense here that I think Stoicism is sort of related to, though they're obviously very different. You wouldn't want to get them confused. But there's a similar insight in both of them, which is namely the idea that when we learn the... Um, then when we learn our desire, when we learn that suffering comes from desire, and we learn to control our desires, we'll begin to recognize that we are already happy. Or in the Buddhist sense, we already have enlightenment. Um, so I think that's a sort of key element. There's another good example here I'll pull from the Encridian, um, in which he, he gives an example of a woman who, um, a mother, rather, whose child dies. And he says, what about that? What about, that's the sort of worst case of suffering one can imagine, that is, a, a, ch a mother losing her child. Well, wait a second. I can't control whether or not another person born in the world is going to die or not, right? Um, and of course, a mother can't control that her child doesn't die, right? Because she doesn't want the child to die. But that means that a mother shouldn't desire something that's like that, right? Because it's outside of her control. A mother should only desire what's in her control. And so Epictetus gives this famous saying. He says, he says, the mother who's lost the child should not say, I've lost the child, but rather say, I've given the child back, right? You've given the child back to divine providence because ultimately the gods will that the world be the way it is, including the death of your child. Now, what does this mean ultimately? It means that the Stoics are going to look at something like the Holocaust, and they're going to say that despite the evil that it appears to be, it actually happens according to um, divine providence, and it's not in our control, and so therefore we should approach it with an unimpassioned or a disimpassioned perspective. And we should reckon, we shouldn't desire that things were different, but rather desire that they are the way they are. That's not easily done, right? Um, it's, I, can't, it's, I can't do that when I think of the Holocaust and, and with desire that it, it happened. I can only desire a change, right? I, I see, so I'm not a full Stoic in that view, but at least you can see here that this is how the Stoics think. This is their technique for gaining happiness. And so finally, to conclude here, we've now looked at two different philosophies of, of happiness, one, both of which are freedom from. The first is freedom from pain or suffering. That's Epicurean hedonism. And the second is freedom from our passions or the emotional involvement we have with things that are outside of our control. And that is stoicism. So I hope you enjoyed these philosophies. I think that, uh, I, that you'll really, really love reading this stuff because it's utterly rich. And, I, and it really sort of fits nicely within the ancient wisdom literature. So please read it. You'll enjoy it. And I think you'll find something profitable for your own happiness. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys online.